Thank you very much for the honor of being able to speak here and report about a development which we think is highly fascinating. As you just heard, we have all been brought up with the notion that any focusing light microscope is fundamentally limited by diffraction. If you want to see details that are much smaller than that, much finer than that, we have to resort to electron microscopy. Uh, but it's clear that many applications, especially in the life sciences, cannot be carried out with an electron microscope because um, um, if you want to see a cell in three dimensions, um, even an intact cell, a live cell in three dimensions, then there is really no alternative to using focused visible light. Now, for that reason, it made a lot of sense to readdress the resolution issue and to ask, is there really no way to break the diffraction barrier and to come up with a focused in light microscope that has the resolution of a sort of electron microscope? Now, we know today that for fluorescence microscopy, which is the most important application area of microscopy in the life sciences, this is indeed possible. But if you think about the way it works, you will realize that it's not fundamentally limited to fluorescence imaging. Now, um, the reason why people have saw that resolution of, um, say, focusing fluorescence light microscope has come to an end is very simple. In trying to focus the light down to a point, the lens fails in doing so, and we get a blob of diffracted light which is at least about 200 nanometers in the focal plane, about 500 nanometers along the optic axis, so the diffraction spot. So all the features falling within that spot, of course, um, will be illuminated at the same time. They will give off light at the same time. And so as a result, it will not be possible to tell them apart. Now, the first person who realized this problem um, um, coined this problem into an equation, which is still named after him, Ernst Abbe. And you see this diffraction resolution barrier um, written in this equation, formulated in this equation, saying that in order to be separated, two features of the same kind have to be away at least by um, uh, a distance given by the wavelength divided by twice the Merkle aperture of the lens. Now, as you may know or not know, Ernst Abbe has had many contributions to optics. But for some reason, this diffraction uh, resolution barrier in this equation is regarded as his most important scientific legacy. Because if you happen to travel to Jena, where he lived and worked, you will find this memorial erected in his honor and this equation uh, written in stone. And this is actually what we want to beat now. We would like to show that it's possible to discern features that are much closer than the value given as a limit by Ernst Abbe. Now, if you don't believe in this, you still got to believe in something. And what I believed in is that if you fully explore the properties of a fluorophore, the spectral properties of a fluorophore, transitions in a fluorophore, then it should be possible to dramatically improve the spatial resolution in a far-field light microscope. Now, it's called far-field now because at that time, in the early 90s, there was already a microscope in place that overcame the diffraction barrier, namely the near-field optical microscope. Um, that's a fine instrument, but clearly a near-field optical microscope is not applicable to imaging a cell in three dimensions because there's no way to get, of course, with a probe non-invasively inside a cell. Now, that's the philosophy. Um, the question is now, can you do this concretely? Is there a concrete pathway to breaking the fraction barrier according um, to, um, say, uh, following this pathway of, say, exploiting the properties of a, of a dye? Now, the first concrete concept that really worked is the concept of stat microscopy, and I'm trying to explain this briefly to you. Now, in a stat microscope, in its most simplest variant, we have an objective lens, of course, and we have a beam for exciting fluorophores from the ground state to the excited state, and of course, the objective lens will focus the light down to a spot that is limited by diffraction. Now, you see the focal plane and a sketch of an object over there, and so all the molecules that reside within that 200 nanometer diffraction size spot will, say, be excited basically at the same time and give off light at the same time. And so the detector, which is now detecting the fluorescence light, is not able to separate the signal because they will all give light at the same, off light at the same time. And so the resolution was simply given by the size of the diffraction spot. And of course, in such an instrument, we get um, uh, an image by scanning this diffracted limited spot across the uh, specimen. And this is typical, for example, for a confocal microscope. Now, if the problem is that all these molecules emit light at about the same time, a solution to the problem is, of course, to make sure that this is no longer the case. So the question is now, can we break the diffraction barrier by making sure that fewer molecules emit at a given point in time and fewer molecules are detected? Well, and is there a molecular mechanism that allows you to do this job? The answer is yes, because um, as any physicist know, knows, not only, of course, you can excite molecules, but you can also uh, de-excite molecules, can make sure 
you can make sure that they are staying dark simply by introducing a beam inducing stimuli and emission from the excited state of the ground state. So the idea here is um, in the case that the molecules get excited within a diffraction limited spot, we apply a second beam of light inducing stimulated emission right to the ground state. And um, that beam inducing stimulated emission has, of course, to be redshifted in, in respect, with respect to the wavelengths so that it doesn't excite molecules, but it will notice those molecules that happen to be located in the excited state, and then they will be instantly kicked down. And as a result, the molecule will not be able to thress because the majority of the energy is taken away in a simulated photon that goes straight with the beam. We don't care about that. And we measure the residual fluorescence that, um, that is found in the detector, which is, of course, at a different wavelength. Now, just using um, a beam of light for stopping the spontaneous emission wouldn't be helpful if it was, was just focused on that excitation spot. So we have to do something that we see, say, a selected range of molecules, a selected amount of molecules. And this is why we apply this phase modification. So we modify the beam such that it forms a donut. And now, of course, you see what we want to do. We want to stop, of course, the fluorescence emission at the outer part of the spot by inducing the stimulated um, uh, emission with the red beam. And so we must get a slightly higher spatial resolution because some of the molecules turn dark. And so they are not visible uh, for the detector. Now, you see that just a few molecules turn dark in this scheme. Actually, what we want to do is we would like to stop more molecules from emitting fluorescence. And how can we do that? It's very simple. Now, in order to stop a molecule uh, from emitting a fluorescent light by stimulated emission, you have to make sure that the beam has a certain intensity. Because if the beam has a certain intensity that is beyond a certain threshold, we can be sure that in any case, the molecule, uh, if it's excited, will be kicked down to the ground set because there are so many stimulating photons in the air that the probability of, uh, of uh, the reaction of stimulated emission is very high, say beyond, say, 95%. Or we can say we can saturate, so to speak, the transition from the excited state to the ground state. And indeed, if you, say, measure or calculate the fluorescence probability as a function of the intensity of the stimulating beam, you will see that this is a sort of exponential function. And so you can induce um, or uh, uh, define a threshold. And once the intensity is beyond that threshold uh, of the stimulated beam, you can say that we have turned the fluorescence off. This is just a fair way of explaining things. And now, it's obvious what we do. In order to turn off more molecules in the focal region, we increase the intensity of the stimulating beam, and then, of course, fewer molecules will be left over, left emitting. And so we see the fluorescence from fewer molecules, therefore, more selectively in space. And as a result, we can fundamentally overcome the diffraction barrier. And now we see only those molecules that are, say, at their periphery, at the, at the inner side of the, of the excitation beam. And this is exactly how it works. So the role of the stimulating beam is not to generate stimulated photons as in the laser. The only role is, is to basically disallow the population of the excited state or to keep the molecules dark in terms of fluorescence. Now, how do we get a picture in this case? Well, we just um, scan, of course, this, um, um, these beams uh, across the specimen. And then we can selectively see few molecules at a given point in time. And as a result, we can discern the features very, very clearly. Keep in mind that all these molecules, of course, are flooded with excitation light. There's no way out. Uh, it has to be so that all the molecules are excited. But it doesn't matter, because the stimulating beam turns them off, those at the periphery, and we see only those that are in the inner part of the spot. So this concept works by, by off-switching, so to speak, the uh, fluorescence ability of the dye in order to see a few molecules uh, more selectively in space. And this is exactly how we break the diffraction barrier. Now, the resolution, of course, will be given by the size of that small region in which fluorescence is still allowed. And that size, of course, can be very small. And this is measured in here. So here we have a diameter of about 218, uh, 20, um, 220 nanometers for a normal confocal microscope. And then we have 28 nanometers for the STAT case, measured with, with a probing single molecule, which was scanned through the focal region. And clearly, if that region has become so small, then we must be able to see much sharper uh, than before. And this is shown here um, in this comparison. On the left-hand side, you see a confocal recording of individual molecules dispersed on a surface. And now you see the stat counterpart. And clearly, one is able to discern uh, molecules that are very close um, to each other. Why? Because they give off light at the same time. They emit 
um, at, at different points in time. Whereas in a confocal microscope, you can discern them because they give off light uh, basically at, on, at once and then the uh, uh, detector registers them uh, simultaneously. Now, the point that I would like to make here is that we just use molecular transitions of the dye. So this is just a physical phenomenon. There is no need for any computation or image restoration or something like that. Um, this is the strength of the method. Now, this has been shown here for individual molecules. Um, it's, uh, of course, uh, not dependent on the kind of structure that you want an image. So confocal on the left for this particular case, uh, stat on the right, it's very obvious that one is able to discern um, those uh, nanoparticles quite well, whereas in a confocal case, you have no clue uh, what is going on, just, again, by molecular transitions. Now, an important step in the development was to show that um, you can take, say, useful pictures in biological applications. And so uh, we teamed up with biologists in order to learn something about uh, how this microscope is able to image proteins at a higher spatial resolution. This is shown in here. So this is a distribution of proteins recorded confocally, and then with a stat microscope. And then one can see these classes of proteins much better than before, again, just by exploiting um, the transitions between states um, of the floor four. And this is raw data. Of course, you can do mathematical deconvolution and so on on top of it, but, uh, but raw data uh, in most cases uh, is enough. Now, initially, this is quite interesting. We started out with a relatively complex laser system simply because um, um, we needed flexibility in terms of both excitation and uh, stimulated emission. You have to fit it, of course, to the emission and, uh, um, and the absorption spectrum of the dye. And um, this worked well, but it has led to the notion that in order to uh, implement a stat microscope or to perform stat microscopy, one requires uh, very complex laser systems. Now, clearly, these have led to sharper images, as you can see here, uh, but have somehow, um, well, hindered the dissemination of this technique. And this is why we put some effort in um, simplifying a stat microscopy, and that, this is what I'm going to talk about next. Now, uh, laser development has been uh, quite, um, quite dramatic during the last years, and, and one um, possible option uh, of, of using, uh, I'll say, a, a compact laser systems for that is to use a supercontinuum source. So a supercontinuum source has the advantage that it provides the right wavelengths for the excitation because it, um, it gets light out of the visible spectrum, and then also for the stimulated emission. And so this has allowed us to set up a relatively simple system uh, that can be used uh, very easily by anyone because, because uh, as I said, it's inherently, the, the, the light that we use is inherently synchronized. And so um, we uh, have uh, uh, a very easy way to get a very high spatial resolution image. In fact, we set this up for, for um, a lab course. And so this is the type of uh, picture that a student can get uh, by um, yeah, using this uh, type of microscope. Now, this supercontinuum source um, is, of course, a pulse source with pulses in the range of about 90 to 100 picoseconds, 1 to 5 uh, uh, megahertz, um, and uh, it can also be used um, for, to color images. I don't know if it's possible to dim down the light a bit, but in any case, here you see um, uh, a confocal image of a, of a human glioblastoma, confocally recorded, and then with that, and if the room was a bit darker, then you could see the details, of course, very, very clearly. Now, it can be done even more simple. Uh, I mentioned that initially we used uh, pulse laser systems for very good reasons, because then you can, say, excite with one pulse and then and, and stop the excitation with a stimulated emission. You can separate the two, and then the, the stopping my stimulated emission, the fluorescence emission by stimulated emission is very, very effective. But of course, one can also use continuous waves, be, wave beams. And um, indeed, um, uh, the advent of very compact uh, CW fiber lasers has simplified matters quite a lot. So in principle, you can excite, you can excite with, a, with a laser pointer, and then you can use um, uh, a fiber laser uh, giving out, say, half a watt or watt or 1.5 watts, and there's still ample light in order to do microscopy with it. And in particular, um, since there is a wide range of, of CW lasers, I think this is a very, very attractive way of doing stat microscopy, also because uh, you get fluorophores, uh, you get fluorescence um, uh, throughout the time because there is no, um, no breaks in between pulses. It's a continuous exposure of fluorophores. Now, CW stat microscopy has become actually quite popular uh, because it can be done with many popular dyes and, um, in fact, has also become uh, commercially available and the pulse version has become commercially available. 
Um, the reason why I'm showing this is to make it, aware, make it clear to you that um, um, you can easily add STAT to any standard, say, confocal microscope. So this is a standard confocal microscope, and then uh, what is added here is a second beam of light that is shaped into a donut by applying a helical phase ramp, and then, of course, uh, just scan the beams um, with uh, jointly the excitation beam and the stand beam, and you get the higher spatial resolution. Now, a strength of um, a focusing light microscope is the ability to, to record dynamics. That's not really possible in the electron microscope, as I said, um, and, um, and also its simplicity of use. But recording dynamics clearly is a strength. And under physiological conditions, of course, this becomes very important. What I'm showing here is a movie that has been recorded from the, the stretch of a dendrite in a living urine in, um, in brain tissue. It's a hippocampal organotypical slice. And now we can see um, this um, uh, dendritic spines with much greater clarity than before. The resolution is improved roughly by a factor of three to four in an X and Y direction, but still under physiological conditions. This is that on the yellow uh, fluorescent protein. And um, one can follow, uh, for example, over time, how such a dendritic spine changes shape and uh, this clearly plays a role in, in learning. So if you learn something, there's a morphology change of these parts, and this is here um, recorded, so to speak, with uh, high spatial resolution under physiological conditions. Now, the strength of the method is that you can go relatively deep down in, in the sample. So this is 10 microns deep down, um, and you have a, still a high spatial resolution of 63 nanometers, and then 25 microns deep down in the living brain slice, and then 65 microns deep down, and then um, 80 microns deep down, you still have a high spatial resolution, and one can measure um, those uh, spine necks very clearly, and the, uh, one knows quite well that the that, uh, spine necks, or the size of the spine necks, the diameter of the spine necks, um, uh, plays a physiological role. It, and changes during potentiation. One can have even faster dynamics. You may have noticed these images were on the second scale, but of course uh, one can be faster, so if there is enough brightness, we can, uh, of course, um, um, see uh, how things move very quickly. And this is now, please run the movie, um, uh, a comparison of a confocal recording. Now you see a confocal recording. Now we switch over to stat. We turn on the stat beam, and as a result, we see now the particles, whereas uh, in a normal confocal microscope, uh, that's not possible to, to identify these particles. So this is recorded at 80 frames per second, so it's a two and a half times um, beyond video rate, and it's showing that you can break the diffraction barrier and at the same time record at video rate. And this is, of course, something that is needed in, in the life sciences. And talking about the life sciences, this is an application in the life sciences. So we apply this video rate stat recording, stat nanoscopy, to um, um, say discerning the movement of individual synaptic vesicles in a living neuron. So this is a confocal snapshot, what you see now. And clearly, the confocal microscope is not able to discern individual vesicles and clearly not their movements. But now. Uh, we um, record a movie with that, and now we can see the movement of indi individual synaptic vesicles actually quite clearly. This is not Brownian motion, by the way. This is a clear, say, physiologically relevant movement and can learn something about, uh, about the neuron and how the neuron, um, uh, say, transports the vesicle um, in order to communicate with another neuron, for example. So this is recorded at 28 frames per second, and the meaning of the image of the recording is that you can break the diffraction barrier and at the same time record other physiological conditions. I think this is uh, clearly um, something that is very interesting. Another application. So this is colloidal crystal formation uh, at sub-diffraction spatial resolution. You see now colloidal crystal with high resolution stat, and then there's a comparison confocal. You see nothing. The reason why I'm showing you this is that this is recorded at 200 frames per second, so it's much, much faster than the play, display in here. So if there is enough brightness, then, um, then you can go as fast as you want and still image beyond the diffraction barrier. Now, I'm coming back to the principles. You have, may have noticed that um, I mentioned all kinds of resolution numbers, like 50 nanometers, 20 nanometers, or 80 nanometers. And so you may ask, what is the type of resolution that we get? And what is the limit now, or what is the actual, say, conceptual limit of the microscope? So let's get back to the principles. Now, 
That's very easy to explain. Again, this is uh, uh, the layout of a typical, say, single beam scanning a stat microscope. We have the excitation beam, which is regularly focused. And without stat beam, without simulating beam, the spatial resolution will just be given by RBS equation, so the size of that region in which we will excite all molecules inevitably, because um, it's not possible to focus the spot any sharper. However, by applying that stat beam, we shut off a number of molecules, and so we see fewer at a given point in time. And it's clear, the further up we go with the intensity, with the stimulating beam, the fewer molecules will be allowed to emit at a given point in time and measured by the detector. And so the size or the dimensions of the region in which molecules are registered, of course, will go down. So delta R will not be described by the Abbas equation anymore, so by a different equation. And it's very obvious that the ratio of the intensity that is applied, say, at a donut crest, for example, with regard to the threshold intensity, will, of course, um, uh, be somehow in the denominator, because the larger that ratio gets, uh, the smaller delta R will get. And so it must be here in the denominator. But if you do the calculation right, you will find out that it's not just the ratio, it's the square root of the ratio that really matters in this case. Now, this equation is OK almost, but it has a slight problem, because um, if the intensity of the stat beam i is 0, of course, then we would divide by 0, and delta r would go to infinity. We can easily fix that problem by putting in a unity, and now everything is OK, and this equation uh, really works out well. So if i is 0, then delta r is Abbas equation. But if i becomes large over is, then clearly, we have um, a spatial resolution that is far beyond Abyss diffraction barrier. And as a result, we can tune, of course, the spatial resolution by cranking up the power. And now we see only two molecules at a given point in time. There is fewer fluorescent photons coming out, but it doesn't matter because we get photons just from the, way, from the place we want. Or in some cases, of course, it's not very wise to have a spatial resolution because the object features are larger. Say, why would you have a spatial res like to have a spatial resolution of 5 nanometers, for example, if you have vesicles of the size of 50 nanometers? So, so you can decrease the spatial resolution, you get more signal, you can image faster. And, um, and, um, and so I think this is a, a clearly a strength of the method. So I'm trying to, to play now with it. And um, you can adapt the spatial resolution. That's my point. However, there's another thing that I would like to mention. I think this is perhaps the most important thing. If you ask me what is the real, say, say meaning or value of, of stat microscopy, if you see it, say, say in retrospect or, um, um, say, in, in, in the context of the history of development of, of, of fluorescent light microscopy, then I would say, well, it's the first concept that improves the spatial uh, resolution by playing an on-off game, making sure that not all molecules are able to emit that are illuminated by the excitation light, but only fewer of them. So that's one thing. But the other thing, I think, is equally important. It really tells you that you can break the diffraction barrier fundamentally. In essence, of course, we can have only one molecule within that small range. Now, for example, we have two. Can we separate the two in that range? No, because they give off light at the same time. That's very clear. But how can we separate the two? Well, we cranked up the power a bit in order to turn the other one off. And how do we break the diffraction barrier? Then in the end, we break the diffraction barrier um, by making sure that, say, this molecule is off when this one is on, and vice versa. This is on when this is off. And this is how we separate them. OK, so we can really say that um, we can break the diffraction barrier and in the end, since this region can be as small as a molecule, we can attain molecular scale resolution with focused visible light. So we do not shift the barrier to a new barrier. The barrier is truly broken. And this is actually reflected here in the equation. Because if I gets large over s, of course, then it's very clear that um, um, the delta r uh, goes to 0. And so, yeah, the diffraction barrier is gone. Now, this is a kind of interesting thought, because um, the question is now, what does it actually mean that delta R goes to very small values, molecular scales? Um, or what does it mean that I becomes large over IS? And of course, if you look into this, into this very simple diagram showing this on-off transition, so this off-switching of the fluorescence ability um, uh, by um, a beam of light, in this particular case, stimulated emission, I becoming large over IS means nothing but that curve becomes steeper. OK? Because um, it means it's the same thing as, um, as, um, as IS becoming small with respect to I. So if I have 
if you have a very steep on-off curve, so very per a perfect switch, so to speak, on to off, then we must get a very, very high spatial resolution. And this is actually one way of optimizing um, this concept. So the question is now, are there organic fluorophores that allow you to do this digital on-off switch like this? Perhaps there are not so many, um, but there is clearly one inorganic fluorophore um, that can do the job already. So these are color centers in diamond, so charged nitrogen vac vacancies in diamond that if you excite them with 530 nanometer, for example, they fluoresce in, in the red regime. And your Quachtrup, who has pioneered the study of these um, NV centers, they found in, in the mid-90s um, in a science paper that they are very, very photostable. And so we so investigated them uh, to find out if they're also photostable under stat conditions and if you can get this very digital on-off switch. And now you see it um, here, um, that, that, say, rectangular curve, this on-off switch is not a cartoon anymore. That's a true measurement. It really shows that they can turn on and off this NV synthesis by light uh, very, very, very steeply. And not surprisingly, we... Um, we could get a very high um, spatial resolution. We could demonstrate here um, a spatial resolution down to about 8 nanometers, um, which is, of course, far beyond uh, what is given with a, uh, uh, with a, um, a say, confocal microscope, which has a resolution about 220 nanometers, just by, say, using the transitions within that color centers, in this particular case, simulated emission. Now, we can take images, of course. On the left um, panel, you see confocal, and then instead on the right, and the confocal, there's almost nothing to be seen, and instead clearly discerns the individual color standards. So this is recording number three, four, five, um, then again a confocal reference, and then again, it works like this because there is no photo bleaching and there is no blinking here in the bulk diamond. You can get a very, 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 very crisp images. And so this shows that, say, not necessarily photo bleaching puts an end to this type of techniques. There are fluorescent compounds that are very, very stable, meaning that if you manage to break down the diamond to little diamonds, produce nano diamonds that can be used as labels, and this is further down the road, of course, but very, in the end, should be viable, um, you can image as many times as you want. There will be no photo bleach, no degradation. All the time, say, a spatial resolution is far beyond the refraction barrier. And this is, of course, uh, very, very interesting for, for many, many applications. Now, if you can get as many photons as you want, then you can get very crisp data. And if uh, the color centers are separated by stat, for example, as it is done here, then it's clearly possible to locate their position individually. So this has nothing to do with the breaking the diffraction barrier. This is just calculated the centroid of something. This can be done with arbitrary position. This has been known for many, many decades. And so we've done that here. And so we measured a, a calculated centroid. And then we found, um, say, the position of each of these color centers with a precision of the order of uh, uh, one to two angstrom. And so this is at the atomic scale. Now, at the risk of sounding too dramatic, it means that in a confocal microscope, we do not see anything. There's no way to find out anything about these color centers. But in the stat microscope, in the end, we can uh, find out the position of each of these defects with atomic precision. Keep in mind, it's inside the crystal. It's not just on the surface. It's inside the crystal, um, about a micron or two. And so we are able to discern that and, of course, um, see these, um, uh, these color centers non invasive There's no other method that could do that um, because it has to be done with focused visible light. And, of course, this tells you that something has really happened in the field of, um, of far-field uh, fluorescence microscopy. Now, the point that I would like to raise here is the following. The intensity that we require is of the order of megawatt or gigawatt per square centimeter, and you may say that this is on the high side. Not so much, because it's still by two orders of magnitude lower than what people use in multiphoton microscopy. And this is not surprising, because in the multiphoton case, you have to have two or, say, three photons operating or acting at the same point at the same, um, at the same time. And so it works by photon density. But here, it doesn't work by photon density. It just means a transition between two states. So it inevitably works at at a lower power. But still, you can say it's a bit on the high side. And so in the next step in development was to say, is, this possible to, is it possible to reduce the intensity that is required to play the on-off game? And the answer is, of course, yes. Because um, if you think about what causes the high requirement of intensity, then it's clear that it's just the lifetimes of the states. Because if you have a short 
a lived state, like a fluorescent state living about a nanosecond, I have to put in many stimulating photons to make sure that within that short period of time, one to nanoseconds, the molecule is not able to emit, but kick down the ground state. So in other words, if I'm resorting to an on-off transition in the dye that has metastable states, on, on states or off states that are metastable, then I have enough time. Then I don't have to hurry up with putting in many photons within a short period of time. And as a result, I can do this, this transition from, definite transition from one state to the other um, with much lower, lower power. And so the other option was to, say, deplete the ground state, um, say, by, by pushing the molecule to a triple state, make a spin flip. So it's cut over there with saying GSD standing for ground state depletion. And now the trick is, the dark state, the triplet state, has a much longer lifetime, microseconds, as opposed to nanoseconds. So one can do this, not, um, at, doesn't have to use megawatts per square centimeter in order to do this on a transition, but kilowatts is enough. Now, there is even other options. There are even other options. For example, you can uh, use cis-trans photoisomerization to play this on-off game. And if the lifetime of the states is even longer, milliseconds or seconds, then it's clear that, that um, you can break the diffraction barrier at very low light levels, even with a power level supplied by an LED. This is not an intensity game. This is a transition game. Make a definite transition from one state to the other in order to be able to separate the molecules that reside within the diffraction barrier. And of course, that's very interesting to biologists. You can also switch fluorescent proteins, so activatable proteins, reversibly photoactivatable proteins, of course, uh, are able to do the job. Now, this is the reason, actually, why um, we um, uh, generalized this concept um, into a concept which are called resolved, meaning that any, say, uh, saturable, switchable transition between the two states can do the job. And it's done with a pattern of light that, um, that has a re region where the molecules are staying in a particular state, and then, uh, say, a zero, for example, and right next to it, of course, the molecule goes to another state. And so by scanning, for example, that pattern across, um, across the specimen, one gets, one gets the fluorescent image. Now, this concept is powerful, but it has a, a challenge. The challenge is that if you scan a beam like this, determining where the molecule has to be off and where it's allowed to be on, then you switch the molecules many times between the on and the off state. And this works well for stimulated emission and also for some other transitions, but for the transitions that I mentioned, attractive ones with the say, reversal with switch with proteins or cis-trans isomerization, there's a finite um, switching um, cycle number, like there's such thing as switching fatigue. Why I think this can be sorted out, initially this has hampered the development of this technique, um, and since then, uh, a shortcut was found using the same on-off switching mechanism, but implemented in a different way. So in this concept called palm storm, all the molecules are initially in the off state, and then they are switched to the on state stochastically in space. So we do not, in this case, determine where the molecule is on, where it is off with a beam of light that is patterned, but it's done stochastically in space such that only one molecule resides within that 200 nanometer range. Now, provided that that on state gives off many photons in a row, we can, we can record that, we can project that fluorescence on a camera and localize the position of uh, individual molecules, and then we find out where it is. So the separation is still done by on-off, but in this case, we have to find out the position by this localization. This is how PALM works. PALM actually stands for photoactivation localization microscopy. And so people thought initially, and this is how these three papers uh, suggested uh, this concept, that um, you would have to use something that is switchable generally, as like cis-trans or um, activatable. Um, but uh, uh, if you know that this is an on-off game, you, can, you realize that this works with, um, say, in principle, any on-off transition that gets you to a bright state emitting many forms in a bunch. And so we resorted to this um, spin flip that we introduced many years back. And so we implemented a version that also reads out stochastically and, um, and works with any dye, basically, uh, with uh, like rhodamines, for example, so, so that we push it to the triplet state, which is inherent to any, any molecule, and get very high spatial resolution. So this is strikingly simple because you need just one laser, one camera, and gets you more colors, even living cell. Under some conditions, um, it's a bit harder to control than a pure photoactivation, but currently it's one of the most popular ways of doing, um, say, nanoscopy. Uh, with focused visible light. Now, to sum up, um, we've seen now there are many, say, acronyms standing for different ways of, of getting high spatial resolution. Um, and of course, there are, there are differences in between them. But if you develop this kind of thing, and if you train as a physicist, of course, then you're interested in, in knowing 
what is the common fundamental element? Or is there any such thing as a common fundamental element this which is allowing us now to overcome the diffraction barrier? What is the reason why we can't take now these pictures, but 15 years back we couldn't take the picture? Something must have happened. A, a kind of element must have been introduced in the game in order to be able to take these images. Now, if you think about it, what could that be? Certainly, it's not the making of donuts, because this has been done ages before. Clearly, it's not a calculating of position with very high precision. This has also been done for decades, and no one could take sharper pictures, even for single molecules. Just, you cannot break the diffraction barrier by locating the position of something, just as you cannot break the diffraction barrier by positioning a donut with extremely high precision. So what is it? Now, I think it's very obvious. It's the on-off game. If you have two molecules that are closer than the diffraction barrier, and you cannot separate them because they give off light at the same time, because inevitably you excite them at the same time, more or less, you make sure that this one is off, when this one is on, and vice versa. Or at least there should be in different states. And so it means that all these methods play the on-off game and transfer the molecule that's more general between two different states. Need not to be on-off literally. Could also be green and blue or scattering, non-scattering. And this tells us it need not be fluorescent. It could be also something else, like emitting a positron, not emitting a positron, or whatever, as l whatsoever. As long as it is distinguishable, of course, one can break the diffraction barrier. And so, currently, there are two ways of playing the game, either say deterministically with a focused beam of light with donuts or stripes or stochastically in a storm-like way. Each one has strengths and weaknesses. This one um, is a bit faster because it grabs the signal of many molecules at the same time. The other one has to operate with single molecules within two nanometer range, but has the advantage that it requires only one switching cycle per on-off. So this is a, a clear strength of the palm storm concept. But they all play the on-off game. So that's the real cause why this is now possible. And this is interesting to see that um, this has been not seen for so many years because it's a very simple key. Now this is just to sum up and to show that we are able to record images and there are many, many um, fields of application. Probably this is transformative for the life sciences. And I think also in material science, polymer sciences, there's a wide range of applications. And uh, after acknowledging the uh, team uh, who has contributed significantly to this development, I'm coming to my last slide. It's clear uh, that Abe's equation had a true meaning um, and it's uh, still relevant for, for many, many cases. There's no doubt about the fact. However, there are many cases in which this equation no longer holds. And, and obviously we've seen that we can, we can overcome the diffraction barrier and discern things that are, are at much closer distance. Now, for the case of STAT and everything that is related to STAT, it's very easy to deal with this equation. We can now expand it by uh, plugging in the square root factor. And now this tells us a different story. Um, it's clear that this resolution also scales with the wavelengths. It must scale with the wavelengths because all the beams are diffracted. We don't break diffraction. Diffraction is still there. But we break the barrier set by diffraction. Why? Because if I gets large of IS, then the nominator gets large and D goes down to zero. So we break the diffraction barrier. We don't circumvent the diffraction, we break the diffraction barrier. But the diffraction is still there. Now, if you ask me, what is the element that has been introduced? I said it already. Now, in the past, people just thought about waves. So obviously, question about waves. Also, near field optics about waves. Metamaterials is about waves. Modify waves. Change the waves. Here is a different story. This is not about waves. This is about states. I over IS tells us how well we go from one state to the other. So if you ask me, what made this development possible? Why are we now so easily able to get these pictures, say, with a spatial resolution and nanoscale so easily? Why? Because we introduced the states into the equation. This is the real cause for the breaking of the diffraction barrier. Make use of the states, forget about the waves. And this is why we are now able to take these pictures. Thank you very much.